So welcome. Uh, we're going to basically, today's uh, presentation is going to cover basics on VLANs on the CRS. We're not going to go too far in depth. The idea here is, is for people who are having issues getting moving on the basic parts or moving from other vendors to uh, MicroTik, the CRS, uh, it's going to get you a basic introduction on that. Uh, who am I? I've been in network engineering since basically I graduated high school in 2008. I'm currently finishing my master's in network engineering, security, and management at DePaul University. Um, and then I have a whole host of different certifications, and I'm also a new member of uh, InfraGuard uh, as well. So I'm going to pass things over to Brian. He's going to talk for a little bit, and then uh, you'll get my uh, happy smile on face again. Thank you, Josh. So um, I'm the uh, owner of Baltic Networks. Um, I've been a, uh, a wireline and a wireless ISP for many, many years. I started in the telecommunications uh, industry back in uh, 1983 and uh, have been using uh, Microtik. Started with it in 99 and started playing with it in uh, 2003 um, after I realized the 1999 version wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's been a long road and I've really enjoyed seeing what Microtik's done with their uh, products and router OS. Um, and uh, so I'm also doing some training as well. So, um, so one of the things I always like to refer to with their products is it's the Swiss Army knife of, of, of routers and now switches. Um, the CRS device is uh, not your grandfather's uh, switch. So how many of you are using like, um, like Netgear or Cisco Business or maybe even some of the enterprise stuff in your network. Is any of you using other third-party switches in your network? Okay. So um, one of the neat things about the cloud router switch is that it's got a lot of enterprise features that you would get um, in, in a more expensive switch. It's just that how you get to the end result is completely different than how you're normally used to doing it. So. One of the most um, common questions we get um, on this device is how in the world do I do VLANs with it? And this particular switch has, there's probably, um, we're just gonna talk VLANs right now, but there's probably five or six other subsections in the switching functions that this product can do. Everywhere from firewalls to bridge filters and you, you name it. So um, we're just gonna be covering just how to basically configure basic VLANs um, with that. Um, it's really a kind of a cornucopia <laughs> of uh, VLANs. Um, one of the neat things you can do is you can do VLAN switching. So you can actually take a VLAN 3 and map it to a VLAN 5 if you don't like that. So there's all these different features. Um, again, that's stuff you only see in enterprise level switching today with other vendors. So, um, anyone can name, uh, can anyone name uh, one of the neat features of, of doing VLANs? Anyone doing VLANs in their network? Okay, great, great, okay. So, you know, uh, the biggest thing is, of course, to separate your broadcast domain. So, uh, you know, broadcast uh, network packets, uh, you, get, you get very large networks, um, you can get into broadcast storms, so VLAN cuts that traffic down. Um, port security is a really big thing. Um, a lot of folks now are doing uh, 802.1x uh, port security, so you plug into the switch, it recognizes your MAC address and automatically throws you on a particular VLAN. Um, also, a physical network uh, security, um, just to isolate two networks. Um, with the advent of, of, of virtualization and VMware and Hyper-V and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, we actually have servers plugged into switches doing trunking and you can have virtual machines running on different VLANs and, and set all your security up that way. So a lot, uh, lot of functionality, a lot of features, um, and of course QoS. Um, planning a VLAN. So uh, you would first start by putting your, uh, you know, decide if you want to do a trunk port or an access level mode. Um, then of course broadcasts are only sent to uh, the particular VLAN that you've got those devices configured on. Finally, um, each VLAN uh, subnet, um, you know, you should you know, put a separate subnet on each of those VLANs. So I'm going to turn this back over to Josh here. Thank you, Brian. So now the next thing I really want to bring up really quickly, and this, does, uh, this projector doesn't do justice for it, but at least someone got a laugh out of it, is router on a stick. So I give you router on a stick. Um, that the, the old story behind router on the stick, at least for my professors and everything I've learned in my life, is uh, you know the idea being, 
is uh, back in the old days, before we had layer three switches, is we had to, if you wanted to route between VLANs, you had to literally just plug a router into one port on that switch and you could just pass the traffic down as a trunk to that router and then it would come back down. Uh, the nice thing here is, is the CRS can do the inter-VLAN routing uh, right on board. Uh, we'll cover how to get an IP address set on those interfaces here towards the end of the presentation, but I just wanted to bring that up right off the bat. Next thing is we're really focusing here on the uh, layer two of the OSI model. Um, we're taking packets in, we're going to be tagging them. Uh, they're either going to be going out a port untagged or they're going to be staying tagged on a specific port uh, going down as a trunk. Um, but a quick look here though first at Ethernet frames. Um, in your standard Ethernet frame, the Ethernet tag is injected directly after the source MAC address. Um, I'm a big visual person personally, so I like to take a look at how things work. Um, I spend a lot of time living in packet captures, uh, trying to understand how packets work and how things get from one place to another. So here's our good old friend Wireshark. Um, I actually have a uh, 951 that's set up with basically uh, two ports are switched together and I have another port that pushes out all the traffic that goes over there so I can capture it straight into uh, Wireshark. Some people like to use Sniffer on uh, their MicroTik. This is just a, a uh, setup that I've gone through and personally, uh, you know, it's what I use on a regular basis and I'm extremely comfortable with, uh, so it works well. But here, looking at this packet capture, right off the bat, you're going to see on a trunk port, we have a VLAN ID of 400. Okay, so you're going to see on, tr on tagged ports, uh, which are trunks between switches or between other servers, you're going to see this tag come on. Uh, the nice thing is about this, there are also different desktops, servers, and laptops, and uh, other devices that will take tagged traffic or tag traffic down, so you can have one cable and multiple devices linked together. But as you can see, as we hit the trunk versus the access level port, you're going to see there is no tagging on this access level port. Uh, as there is with on the trunk port. You have that extra 802.1Q piece in the uh, layer two information. Now, has everyone heard of the terms access and trunk? So it looks like a decent number of you have, but not everyone has. Uh, think again trunks as links between switches. Um, also, if you have servers with multiple subnets on them, uh, some guys like to have multiple Ethernet interfaces or multiple fiber interfaces going between a switch and a, a server, but uh, I know a lot of people in the data centers I work in occasionally have a 10 gig link uh, going into a switch and they just are tagging that traffic between the switch and the server. Um, again, links to other network devices uh, that also support VLAN. So this could be you have a CRS hooked into, let's say, uh, you know, a 951 or a WAP, and you're tagging multiple VLANs going over those devices so you can push out multiple SSIDs. Uh, so you can push out a corporate VLAN, a guest VLAN, and maybe a machine-to-machine uh, -machine VLAN if you wanted to. Um, in our example coming up here, we're going to be pushing out a VLAN for a corporate network and a VLAN for a guest network. And then you have the access level. You have to think about this, this is really a device, a, um, a port that is meant for a single VLAN. Now you could also have an access, a trunk that has a native VLAN on it and then also allows tagged traffic. But typically if you have a port that's publicly facing, you want to ensure that it only allows uh, access to a specific VLAN that you want for security reasons. Uh, last thing you want is someone bored who knows networking, hooking into your ethernet jack and uh, discovering you have multiple VLANs and hopping on your corporate VLAN uh, when you really don't want them to. Um, again, links to access points that only have a single VLAN or, again, guest devices. It's very important that you secure uh, public-facing ports uh, quite a bit. So again, here we're looking at, we have some different pieces here. We're trunking certain ports. We have ports that are set up for just access layer for the office and access layer for the guest. So we're going to be walking through the configuration of this now. As I said, this is a very simple and basic um, example here. But, so ports 3 through 6 are going to be trunked. 9 through 13 are going to be access ports for the office users. Those are going to be on VLAN 11. And ports 17 to 20, again, are going to be access point, uh, ports for the guest network, VLAN 21. Now, 11 and 21 aren't any standard. There is no standard really to the exact uh, tagging you should be using. Uh, it's really, we arbitrarily just picked 11 and 21, honestly. It's part of my old design from a project from years ago. But, so the first thing you need to do is slave all your ports uh, to Ethernet 1. 
uh, would be the first thing I would do if you're going to be doing VLANs across an entire switch. So in this case, here's an example, Ethernet 2, master ports Ethernet 1. Once you have them all slaved together, you also have the command line of this here for you to look at if you uh, prefer the CLI. Um, simple and easy, go through, slave them all together. Next, we're going to go through, and we're adding different VLANs here, ports to the VLAN. So we're adding VLAN 11 uh, is what we're creating here. So you're going into the switch chip, you're going to VLAN, and you're hitting add VLAN. In this case, we are adding ports 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and those are going to be trunk ports. We're going to talk about how we're going to set those up more uh, later. And then you're going to also add ports 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. These are going to end up being access layer ports that are going to be configured differently here coming forward. Uh, these ports, again, will be for the office network. Here's the exact same thing again, guys, except we're literally going through and doing this for the guest VLAN, VLAN 21. And here is the command line equivalent for that, guys, again, for anyone who's uh, interested in looking at how the CLI works and functions. I, uh, if you haven't yet, I'd recommend spending some time and getting to know it. It is a extremely useful tool. And I'm also going to take a moment now also to mention that it's very helpful while you're playing with VLANs to have a uh, serial to console cable. Uh, I have several favorite ones for iOS or Get Console or, uh, you know, getting on Mac, Linux, Windows. Have some way to get into that CRS uh, other than an Ethernet port. Uh, main reason there being is if you lock yourself out, it's a lot easier to do it that way than have to do a net install or try to push the reset button and hope you hold it down for the right amount of time. So how do we get trunk ports working? Well, here you're going to go into and you're going to go to switch VLAN and look at the egress VLAN tag. What you're doing here is you're telling it on what ports you want it to tag traffic for that VLAN to come out. So if you look earlier on that VLAN 400 example I showed you guys from the packet capture, you would see these tags of 21 and 11 coming out for packets that are destined for those specific VLAN networks. Here again is the uh, same thing in the command line. Uh, works quite well. Uh, this is actually how I prefer to set these up. Now we're going to talk about ingress ports. Uh, think about ingress ports as things that are coming in to the switch in which port it's coming in at. Um, there's a few other little pieces available here that you're going to see. Uh, you have a service VID, which can be used on the service provider level to actually do Q and Q tagging. So you're able to have a, you'd actually have two VLAN tags on it. And then when the, the packet leaves the service provider network, it would pop that tag off. And then it would go back to the uh, customer's equipment. PCP is used to set priority, and also DEI is used to note drop eligibility indication. So how do we get these ingress ports working? Well, you're gonna, first thing you're going to note is you're going to set up the access level ports here for the office network. Again, this is traffic inbound to the network. So let's say you have a device hooked into port 9, and you want it to access the office network. What you're going to do is you're going to go through, and you're going to set it up that a device coming in with no v, uh, VID of zero, which means none, and then you're going to have it add the tag 11 to it. At that point, anything coming in on that port is going to come through if it has no tag, and it's going to be given the appropriate VLAN tag of 11. Here's the exact same setup, again, for the guest network. For ports 17, 18, 19, and 20, we are adding the VLAN tag of 21. And again, this is the command line equivalent of that. I'll let you guys take a quick second and take a preview on that, but it works very well. Now, the next important thing we need to think about is, well, what about, how does the switch know what ports it needs to push, you know, the tags off of? How do we go about that? Um, you know, you need to set up the egress for ports to be tagged appropriately. So to do this, we're going to go into the VLAN settings and go into egress VLAN tag. The VLAN tag, again, is going to be stripped here in this case. So you're saying for ports 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, if it has the tag 11, strip it off and shoot it out with tag 0, which is no tag. Simple and easy. Works quite well. Same thing here again for the access level ports on the guest network. 
tag 21 is going to leave these ports and it's going to get stripped off. And here is the uh, equivalent of that under command line. Now, how about that uh, inter VLAN routing or setting an IP address up for a, uh, an appropriate uh, IP so you can either have that be a router for you or have it go through and at least be pingable? Um, that's actually quite simple. What you're going to do here is you're going to go in and you're going to add the switch one CPU into the VLAN tag for, that, for the VLAN and also into the switch. From there, you're going to create a VLAN on the master port. So in this case, we are using port one for our master port. So you're going to go through and create VLAN 11 on Ether 1. Once you create that on Ether 1, you're going to go through and then just go into IP uh, addresses and assign it an IP address. Quite simply and easily, you've now gone ahead and given it an IP address that's going to be pingable and routable on that network. And it, without firewall rules, it will allow you to route between those different VLANs. So I'm going to hand it back to Brian. So thanks, Josh. Um, the, uh, so what we've now done with these last few slides, let's go back uh, here real quickly. Did everyone understand the adding of the switch chip uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the switch, the CPU? So basically, until we got to this step, um, we were basically a glorified super switch with no routing functionality or anything like that. So we were just using the CRS as a switch only type device. This is what then allows us to, to take those switch groups and then turn it into really a router or something uh, that you want to do, maybe some natting or, or whatnot. So um, uh, there, the architecture of the CRS is that you've got the switch chip that controls all the ports, and then there's a single tie from the switch chip, which is the switch one CPU into the CPU. It's a, uh, it's a gigabit connection internally, I believe. Uh, between the CPU and the switch chip. So when you start doing routing between VLANs, you have to realize with that architecture, you've only got a gigabit of bandwidth between that switch and CPU. So if you've got multiple VLANs and uh, multiple um, uh, uh, interfaces into the router, you're never going to see more than a gigabit of traffic in and out uh, through that CPU. Um, that's um, all I, uh, we had for the, the uh, uh, routing uh, uh, piece. Were there any, um, any questions that we have so far? Up. So up until this point, I've typically been doing access and trunk ports by doing a bridge interface of a VLAN interface and a port. What are the advantages of doing it on the switch instead? So you've, what you're saying is you've been doing using a software you through router OS. So um, the advantage here is that you're gaining wire speed capability. So if you did it, if you've done it on router OS, you always have to take into account that CPU to switch chip internal interface um, capacity. And um, with this. Uh, this particular device actually has 10 gigabit ports on it. And so there's no way you're going to route 10 gigabits of traffic with this device, but technically using this method, you can actually switch 10 gigabits of traffic. On this particular platform, is it true that you do lose visibility, though, for the traffic flowing through those switch ports as far as ROS is concerned? That's correct, yeah. So unless you actually um, you create an interface into a port and actually snoop on that traffic or whatnot, traffic passing through the switch directly, router OS is never going to see that. It's never going to pass through any counters or, or firewall rules or anything. So, But that said, there are some, the switch chip itself does have additional features, which we, we have not covered here, um, that do allow for some filtering and stuff like that. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.